Maybe not. Hold on. Ah, now let's get started. How's that? Too many chords. I vote for chords. How's everybody doing today? Good, professor. That's very good. Well caffeinated. Well caffeinated. Then learning shall happen, right? This is good. Okay, so um, today I'm going to uh, finish talking about protein structure. We've talked about primary and secondary so far. And today I'll finish talking about uh, tertiary and quaternary. And uh, then we'll uh, look, probably spend more of our, most of our time down here talking about sequence and structure. And there's several things in there that are kind of, of um, really interesting things that start to bring together, I think, the whole perspective of why protein structure is important. And of course, we'll be talking about that over the next week or two, actually. Protein structure relates to every property of a protein, as I've been saying almost endlessly. Um, I start by talking about tertiary structure. Before I talk about tertiary structure, I want to give you a definition for it. Tertiary structure um, is, so first of all, I'll give you secondary structure. I said it resulted from interactions between amino acids that were close in primary sequence. Tertiary structure arises because of interactions between amino acids that are not close in primary sequence. Well, what's close versus not close? All right. Close, roughly, 10 or fewer amino acids. Interactions between, between 10 or fewer are what we would categorize as secondary structure. Something that's more than 10 apart is something we would refer to as interactions giving rise to tertiary structure. Well, tertiary structure has a very different appearance than secondary structure does. Okay? This is a, a, a schematic example on the left and a space filling example on the right of the protein known as myoglobin. Myoglobin is a very important protein. It's found in our body, primarily in our muscles. And in our muscles, it uh, serves the function of storing oxygen. And we'll see later uh, the significance of that storage of oxygen. Myoglobin is uh, fairly closely related to hemoglobin, which is the um, protein in our blood that carries oxygen. And myoglobin's function is better uh, described as storing oxygen. It's kind of like what I like to think of as an oxygen battery. Now, if we look at the structure of myoglobin, and this is the, th the um, uh, 3D uh, image of the structure of myoglobin, what we see is that it has secondary structure in it. It has these alpha helices that we've seen before, and it also has those turns. And it's because of those turns that portions of the protein that wouldn't otherwise be close together are brought into close proximity. So we can think of tertiary structure as arising between interactions between one part of the protein here and, say, another part of the protein here, but they're not close in primary sequence. This might be amino acid number 41, and this might be amino acid number 200, for example. All right? And the only way those interactions happen is because they've been brought into close proximity. And we'll see a little bit later how that actually occurs. It occurs in a process we refer to as folding. And folding is as close, to a, um, as close to a magical process as you will find in biochemistry. Folding is an absolutely phenomenal uh, process. Now, um, tertiary structure is simply that. Tertiary structure gives rise to something that we call globular proteins. And the structure of globular proteins is not random. Okay? It looks like it's fairly random, but it's not. Myoglobin, when it's given the proper chance to fold, will always fold in the same way. It will always have that same structure. Okay? Now that tells us that there's something that's driving that specific structure. And as I said in the very first lecture on protein structure, the thing that drives all the properties of a protein is the amino acid sequence. The amino acid sequence determines what this folded structure is going to look like. The vast majority of proteins that we find in the real world are not fibrous. I talked about fibrous proteins last time. The vast majority of proteins in the real world... No? Okay. Let's see. Is, is that ringing? Are people hearing a ringing? Yeah. Okay. And it's not a phone. It's me. Okay. Uh, 
the vast majority of proteins in the world are in the globular form. Okay? Fibrous proteins are not nearly so common as, as, as globular proteins are. Okay? If I change the amino acid sequence, I will change that folded form. The amount that I change it will determine how much actually varies. If I change one amino acid in here, I probably won't change it much. If I change 50 amino acids, I will change it a lot. Right? So we start to think now that every protein has its own specific amino acid sequence. And if those specific amino acid sequences give rise to specific structures, then we will have a different structure for every protein based on its amino acid sequence. And the answer is that that's exactly correct. Okay? So again, structure is function. When I mutate, if I mutate and I change an amino acid, I could change a structure very slightly. And sometimes very slight changes have enormous effects. Sometimes they have virtually no effect. You can't predict necessarily that a mutation is going to be what we think of as bad. Some mutations are what we think of as good because they actually make the enzyme more efficient. All right? But in any event, when we change an amino acid, we are going to change something about the structure of a protein. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about enzymes and structures. And I think you'll see how very, very tiny changes really can have enormous effects on the properties of a protein. OK. This shows the amino acid, and I forgot my code here. So this shows the amino acid distribution of the um, amino acids in a protein. And they've been color coded. Okay? So it's color coded so that the, the amino acids that are the most hydrophilic okay, or charged are in blue. Those that are the most hydrophobic are shown in yellow. And those that are sort of in between are shown in white. All right? Now, what we see, and it may not be real obvious at first, but what I will tell you that, you're, that is the case, is that there's an uneven distribution of amino acids in this folded protein. The hydrophilics are generally on the outside. And that makes sense because myoglobin is found in the dissolved portion of the cell. It's found in an aqueous solution, the cytoplasm. Okay? Now, Hydrophilics like water. They associate with water very well. And because of that, this protein is soluble okay, in the environment in which it's found. That's not totally surprising. What about the hydrophobics? The hydrophobics don't like water. And so just like oil doesn't like water, and oil forms that, forms that layer that stays away from water, it stays with itself, so too do the hydrophobic amino acids associate with themselves we find an uneven distribution. We primarily find for proteins that are dissolved in the aqueous solution of the cell, we find that the hydrophilics are on the outside of the protein and the hydrophobics are on the inside. Now, this isn't just a random phenomenon. Okay? This tendency of hydrophobic amino acids to like to associate with each other provides a driving force one of several driving forces that cause a protein to fold. Hydrophobics like to associate with each other. And so this really helps get them where they need. So we can think of this as being a hydrophobic glob coated with hydrophilics on the outside. That enables this protein to be soluble. Now, we'll see later in the term when I talk about things like LDLs and HDLs, which are complexes in our blood that carry fat that they're multi-protein complexes, and they arrange themselves in exactly the same way. They put that most hydrophilic portion of themselves on the outside and the most hydrophobic portion on the inside. When we examine proteins that are dissolved in the aqueous solution of the cell, as I said, we almost universally see this arrangement. Okay? So it tells us that um, structure and function are important. If I try to put too many things hydrophobic on the outside, I'm going to have problems. Why do I have problems? Well, if I have a lot of hydrophobics on the outside and hydrophobics like to associate with hydrophobics, what do you suppose is going to happen when one full of hydrophobics on the outside encounters another full of hydrophobics on the outside? They're going to glom together, right? Okay. Now, I'll show you later uh, an example where that actually has important human health implications when proteins don't fold properly. 
Okay. By the way, this little thing in the middle, this little, probably wondering what that is, that's a group called heme. It's the group that gives hemoglobin its name. It's actually the portion of the protein that carries the oxygen. And uh, myoglobin has a heme, just like hemoglobin has a heme. We'll talk a lot more about that later. Now, I described to you a situation where proteins that are dissolved in the aqueous environment of the cell have hydrophilics on the outside, hydrophobics on the inside. Are there violations of that rule? Well, there's, for every rule that's made, there are violations. Okay? And one of the violations we see are in proteins that are found in membranes of the cell. So not all proteins are dissolved in the aqueous environment of the cell. Many proteins are embedded in the membranes of a cell. And that's important because cells use those proteins in the membrane to perform very, very important functions. We'll talk about some of those again later. Uh, one of the proteins that I want to show you uh, in this regard is a protein called porin. Porin is found in the membrane of a cell. And when we examine the distribution of amino acids in this protein, what we see is what people describe as an inside-out protein. The hydrophobics are on the outside, and the hydrophilics are on the inside for the most part. Well, why is that the case? Well, that's the case because membranes have long fatty acid chains in them that are hydrophobic. So the outside of this protein is interacting not with an aqueous environment, but instead with the hydrophobic side chains of fatty acids. Structure, function, go hand in hand. If I tried to put hydrophilics out there associating with it, it doesn't work. Well, why do I even have hydrophilics in this protein at all? The answer is the function of this protein. This protein is called porin. And porin has the function for the cells that have it of letting in water. It's a channel to let water in. Well, water, of course, is water. And water likes hydrophilic molecules. And look where the water goes. It goes right there where the hydrophilic molecules are. All right. So yet another example of structure matching function and uh, teaching us something about protein structure in the process. So I think that's a very important uh, consideration. OK, I'll stop there and take questions. Any questions on what I've said so far? You guys are all asleep today, huh? There are beta barrels, and beta barrels uh, are like the structure I showed yesterday. Beta barrels can have several functions besides doing things uh, inside of membranes, but one function can be actually what you've described. Yeah. Now, with that being, if they're, are they only one layer thick, and if so, are they neutral, or are they predominantly polar? Or okay. So this question is, are they only one layer thick? And the answer is that most proteins in the membrane we find are not really one layer thick. No, they're sort of surrounded by things, kind of like what we see here. Um, and I'll show you an example later of, of an interesting protein in that respect. Okay. All right. So that's the sort of general uh, things I want to say uh, about these. Um, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about tertiary structure in terms of stabilizing it. All right. Tertiary structure is actually a fairly fragile thing. It's fairly fragile. If I look at an alpha helix, all right. I see an alpha helix coiling, 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 coiling. And that coiling might go on for 40 amino acids. And every four or five amino acids, I've got a hydrogen bond that's helping to hold that alpha helix together. Okay? That structure I showed you for myoglobin has an alpha helix over here interacting with an alpha helix over here. But there might only be a couple of hydrogen bonds actually stabilizing that arrangement. All right. It means that there's not as much force or there's not as much energy holding that tertiary structure together as there is the secondary structure. And that means that tertiary structure is relatively unstable by itself. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you some things that help to stabilize it. But it's important that we consider all of the forces that help to stabilize the tertiary structure of a protein. If you've ever tried to purify a protein in the laboratory, some people find that they, they pull their hair out more than I've already had go off at the top of my head trying to get a protein purified because what they discover is the protein literally falls apart or stops working halfway through the purification because its tertiary structure doesn't, isn't very stable. There's not much energy holding it together. Okay? Not all proteins are that way. Gesundheit. 
Not all proteins are that way. So let's talk about some of the forces then that stabilize um, tertiary structure. One of these is actually a very, very strong uh, stabilizing force. It's actually a covalent bond. And that covalent bond is called a disulfide bond. It's a bond between two sulfurs. And it arises as a result of two cysteine side chains being brought into close proximity. Cysteine, I hope you remember in the amino acids, is the one that has an SH side group. If you didn't get that before, you should know that. Cysteine has an SH side group. If I put one SH side group next to another, an oxidation will occur that will join the two sulfurs, getting rid of the hydrogens. And that forms a covalent bond. That disulfide bond is very strong. Remember that covalent bonds are much stronger than hydrogen bonds. And that can be a very important force in helping to stabilize a protein. Okay? So we see that here. Here's a folded protein. It has disulfide bonds, disulfide bonds, disulfide bonds. Here's the same protein unfolded without those disulfide bonds. I'm going to talk more about this protein in just a little bit. Okay? But disulfide bonds are the most um, important stabilizing form for uh, the tertiary structure of proteins. What other forces do we have that help to stabilize them? Well, we obviously have hydrophobic forces. Those hydrophobic amino acids associating with each other on the inside do help to stabilize that protein. Okay. We've got, we've got disulfides, we've got hydrophobics, we've got ionic. All right? Imagine I've got a plus amino acid up here and a minus amino acid down here. They're going to be attracted to each other. Those are also forces that help to stabilize tertiary structure. We can think of hydrophilic in sort of a loose sense of that happening because it's associating with water and that may help to contribute to the structure, although I don't think it contributes a tremendous amount to the stability. But hydrophilic uh, interactions uh, can play uh, somewhat of a role. Hydrogen bonds. We saw hydrogen bonds help to stabilize the alpha helix, the beta strands. Hydrogen bonds also help to stabilize the tertiary structure of a protein. The last force that helps to stabilize a protein, I'll just mention it here and I won't mention it again, uh, are known as metallic bonds. There are some metal uh, carbon bonds that help, uh, in fact, to um, stabilize protein structure. We don't really deal with them too much in this class. Now I'm going to come back to this figure in just a bit when, after I talk about quaternary structure. So bear with me on that. OK. That's the last of what I want to say about tertiary structure. Um, and I want to move our consideration now to quaternary structure. So you've seen, what we've seen in each case are forces between amino acids. They're getting further and further away. And so quaternary structure arises as a result of interactions between amino acids that are actually on separate protein units. Separate protein units. So when I think of an enzyme or I think of certain proteins, they may have multiple polypeptide chains that hold them together. Prime example is hemoglobin. Okay? Hemoglobin actually has four separate polypeptide chains that comprise it. Okay? It has two units called alpha that are identical, and it has two other units called beta that are also identical. And alpha and beta are fairly closely related to each other. And they're also closely related to myoglobin. This is hemoglobin. Yeah. OK? So hemoglobin has four polypeptide chains that are held together by quaternary. They actually, hemoglobin has quaternary structure. All right? So quaternary structure arises when we have completely separate polypeptide chains that are interacting with each other. This is a very common phenomenon in biochemistry. It's not at all unusual. Many enzymes, many proteins have multiple subunits, they're called subunits, that come together. Okay? Now, um, the interactions between the subunits that stabilize quaternary structure are exactly the same ones that stabilize tertiary structure. Hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, metallic bonds, hydrophobic bonds, disulfide bonds, all of those can also stabilize quaternary structure. Now, quaternary structure gives rise to some really interesting things. So first of all, 
you have to have multiple subunits to have quaternary structure. All right? Myoglobin, because it only has a single subunit, doesn't have quaternary structure. But hemoglobin, which is very closely related with multiple subunits, therefore has quaternary structure because those subunits have to interact in some way. Hemoglobin uh, will be a lecture I will give, I think it's next week, uh, that is um, one of the most interesting proteins we'll talk about in the entire term. The amount of functionality that's built into this protein is nothing short of astonishing. And some of the most subtle things that you could imagine give rise to properties like being able to be an animal, being able to move, okay? being able to adjust your oxygen as a result of exercise. Right? These things all arise because of the properties built into hemoglobin, and that just scratches the surface. So that'll be coming up in a lecture very soon. Okay, and here's a case of a super quaternary structure. This is the coat, the virus, I'm sorry, the protein coat of a virus that has infected several people in here. I hear people coughing and hacking. This is the, a picture of the cold virus, okay? And we can see that there are multiple proteins. Each protein has its own distinctive color on here. And these proteins are interacting to form the coat of this virus. When I talked about the ability of viruses to make their coats and have the proteins self-assemble, very much like the pieces of a puzzle putting themselves together. That's actually what's happening here. And what you're forming in the process of that are quaternary interactions, different proteins interacting with each other. So this is a great big example of quaternary structure. OK. Questions always before I dive into some other stuff? Yes, sir? So you're talking about quaternary structure, Kenneth? Is that right? OK. So Kenneth's question is, if we look at the uh, quaternary structure, is there only one force or one bond that stabilizes that? And the answer is no. Just like we don't have one force or one bond stabilizing tertiary structure, so too can we have many bonds and many forces stabilizing quaternary structure. OK? Yes, sir? Yeah. Oh, there's definitely. When we see quaternary structure, we have stabilizing forces. Proteins will not associate with each other without stabilizing forces. Absolutely. You will, you will see that. And you might imagine in the case of a viral coat that the stronger those stabilizing forces are, probably the better off the virus is because the virus has part of their life cycle in the nice, cozy environment of the cell. But for those of you who are sneezing and hacking, and that, that, what you're doing is you're expelling cold virus out into the atmosphere. Okay. That's a pretty harsh environment for um, a coat to have to, to survive. So a strong coat is, is important, and having those stabilizing forces is very important for that. I saw a hand over here. Yeah. So do the subunits okay. independently, are they, are they considered proteins, or only once they form them in a So her question is, are individual subunits proteins, or what? And so the answer is, individual subunits are, OK? And I call the individual subunits, actually, that's why we, the, remember I said we, I use protein and polypeptide chains together interchangeably. Technically, the subunits are polypeptides, and proteins are the complexes that arise from that. So that makes it a little bit confusing, but I'm not going to get you one way or the other on an exam, so don't sweat that. Yes, sir? So how does virus acquire the energy to build this structure? How does a virus acquire the energy to get this structure? Well, uh, it's not a simple answer to that. Virus has... Uh, all the things that it does from the cellular energy in the first place, so making the proteins, making the RNA, making the DNA, they use cellular machinery to do that, so the cell's energy contributes to that. Um, the self-assembly of these doesn't require a giant amount of energy. Okay, so it's, that's a pretty cool trick that they have at the nanoscale. Yeah, that was the one I saw earlier, yeah. Do subunits have to be tertiary structure? Do subunits have to be tertiary structure? You mean, could I have a fibrous subunit and then interact them? Um, I can't think of any good examples, uh, but I, I guess in biology you never say never, right? So uh, I can't think of any good examples, I know. The vast majority of proteins have tertiary structure, okay? The vast majority, 99.9% .9 of the proteins out there have tertiary structure. The examples I gave, hair or nails or silk, 
spider silk, something like that. Those are rare, relatively rare examples of uh, fibrous proteins. Collagen was another rare example, but collagen is pretty abundant. <laughs> yes, sir. Is it more common for a protein to have a functional standalone tertiary structure, or are most proteins uh, amalgamated subunits of quaternary structure? So are most proteins loners, or are most proteins uh, social? Is that, that's the question, right? Um, I haven't done a number count, but I would say in my, just off the top of my head, most proteins are multi-subunit. Most proteins are multi-subunit. So you don't see nearly as many single subunit as you see multi-subunit. And remember, a multi-subunit protein has tertiary structure as well. It has all four levels, OK? All right. OK, well, good questions. Good thinking about this stuff. Um, what I want to do is, is talk a little bit now about that structure and uh, its relationship to sequence. So I first uh, showed you this guy here, ribonuclease. So let me tell you a little bit about ribonuclease. Ribonuclease is a protein that sort of violates that rule I gave you earlier. I told you that ribonuclease was a, uh, I told you that, that most proteins have a tertiary structure that is relatively unstable. So we have to be careful in handling them, OK? We can disrupt most proteins' tertiary structure by treating them with detergent. Why? Because detergent interacts with hydrophobic things, and it gets in the middle of that protein, and it literally peels it apart. We wash our hands to kill bacteria because we're denaturing their proteins. And by the way, when we unfold a protein, we describe it as denaturing it. It no longer has its original shape. It no longer has its original function. Most proteins come apart fairly readily if I add detergent. Most proteins come apart fairly readily if I heat them. Why? Because heat provides enough energy to break hydrogen bonds. Okay? I can break hydrogen bonds with heat quite readily. So by putting a protein at a high temperature, I break hydrogen bonds. That's how I'm killing bacteria when I cook food. Okay? Now, most proteins don't have good stability to, for example, heat. Heat's the example I'm going to give you for the most part. All right? Ribonuclease is an exception to that. Ribonuclease is a protein that breaks down RNA. Okay? If you've ever worked with RNA in a lab, you will hate this protein. You hate this protein because it's everywhere. It's in your skin. It's, you touch a piece of, you touch your skin to any piece of glassware in the laboratory and it's automatically full of RNAs. Well, if you're trying to work with RNA and you've just contaminated it with an enzyme that breaks down RNA, Okay? That's a real problem. If you want to kill this protein, you can't kill it by boiling. Most proteins, gone. You boil them, they, they denature, they've got no activity left. You boil ribonuclease and it's just happy. Okay? It's an exception to that rule. It's very happy. Well, why is it stable and most enzymes aren't? Most enzymes actually have disulfide bonds. So the answer isn't that this has disulfide bonds and others don't. The answer is that this guy has two interesting properties I'm going to describe to you. One is that it has a way of arranging itself so that it readily forms disulfide bonds, even after you've taken it apart. Now I'll show you that example in a second. Okay. It has the ability to rearrange itself so that it reforms the disulfide bonds if it's, if it's gone. So to, tell you, to illustrate that to you, I have to give you an example. All right? Let's imagine I've got some ribonuclease. And I take and I do what's shown here on this treatment. I treat this with two chemicals. Mercaptoethanol is a very simple molecule. And its property is it will reduce disulfide bonds and make them back into sulfhydryls. So remember I said that we put together two sulfhydryls and they oxidize and form a disulfide bond that's an SS bond? What mercaptoethanol will do is it will break that SS bond and it'll put hydrogens on there and they won't be bound together anymore. All right? Now, if I were to take this room and I look at these major supports on the side and I were to chop all of those, we could imagine that this room would probably be somewhat destabilized. We might want to not want to stand down here in the front, right? It might hold up, but then it might not hold up. We've just destabilized the structure of this, of this room. Structurally, it's not the same as it was if I get rid of the support beams, right? Well, we can think of the disulfide bonds as being support beams. 
If I denature this protein by, first of all, treating with mercaptoethanol, what I discover is by treating with mercaptoethanol doesn't destroy it. It still stays functional. So just like this room might still sort of hang around here, we might not want to be in it, we still have the basic structure that's there. The enzyme still functions, but guess what? This enzyme is not nearly as stable as it was. I can make it come apart. Before I, before I, tried to treat, before I treat with mercaptoethanol, I boiled it. It was still active. But now I've taken out the support beams, the disulfide bonds, and I try to denature it. I can denature this protein, and it won't work. Okay. This tells me that these support beams are very important. Very important. So I get rid of the support beams, I can denature it. So the other thing that's here is urea. Urea breaks hydrogen bonds, and this guy comes apart. Yes, sir? When you said it wouldn't work, you were referring to the protein and not the denature. The protein itself wouldn't work. That's correct. Yeah. OK? So the combination of breaking the support beams and breaking the hydrogen bonds causes this protein to unfold. That's denaturation. And now this protein doesn't work anymore. This protein's an enzyme. It doesn't catalyze its reaction anymore. It loses its shape. You see the shape on the side. I could use, instead of urea, I could use heat. Same thing. Heat will break hydrogen bonds. I can heat that guy, and everything's fine. Now, most proteins, once I've denatured them, they will not come back to their native form. They will not come back to the way they were. This room, if I cut the beams and I take a slight bulldozer to it, uh, it's probably after I've let it fall down, not going to reassemble itself back if I magically want, uh, wave my wand at it. Right? Well, ribonuclease has the property that if I'm careful, I can wave that wand, and it'll go back and redo itself. Now, that's really cool. Okay? That's really cool. How does that happen? Well, let's imagine in this experiment, I start, I, I use this. This is a very concentrated solution of urea, by the way. Let's say I take that urea, and I start very slowly removing the urea. Okay? I very slowly start taking the urea out of there. And each time I measure, does this thing that remains have the ability to break down RNA? That's the question, because this guy is an enzyme that breaks down RNA. Before I take the urea out, none of it will break down RNA. But as I start taking the urea out, what I discover is all of a sudden something in the solution starts being able to break down RNA. Now. That simple experiment tells you a very important thing. Okay? It tells you that the information necessary to make this structure is the sequence of amino acids. Because that's the only thing that's there to make this happen. There's no other proteins. There's nothing in the cell. There's only the sequence of amino acids that's there. And these sequence of amino acids are telling this thing, hey, here's the shape you want to have. That's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to take this one step further. If I, let, if I take all of the urea out of the cell, and I look and I say, yep, I've got a heck of a lot more of this activity than I had over here, where I had none. But do I have as much activity as I had before I took it apart? The answer is no, I don't. Now, my question to you is, why? If the information that's necessary to fold this protein is there in this thing over here, why doesn't it all go back to this? It clearly is not, because I don't get everything. I don't get as much activity as I started with. Now, I'll give you a hint. And the hint will surprise you. Okay? One of the ways in which I can increase the amount of activity when I'm taking out the urea is to put a little bit of mercaptoethanol in there. Now, what does that tell you? What's that? OK. So sometimes the sulfurs bounce into each other and not into the places where they do. Because all it takes is bouncing into each other. And once you've got two malformulins, there's no way it's going to form properly. But you put a little bit of mercaptoethanol in there, you allow it to come back apart and give it another chance to fold. It's like giving a person a second chance. If you've ever taken a class and you didn't made a poor grade in the class, right? 
and you said, I want to improve my grade point, so I'll take the class a second time, you get that second chance. That mercaptoethanol is that second chance. I see a bunch of people looking at each other. I hope that's not a common phenomenon. But <laughs> okay, does that make sense? Yes? Is that a repeatable process? That is a repeatable process. Yeah, you could ultimately optimize it. You could. Yeah. Yep. Very interesting insight. Yes, Shen. Um, are you ever going to be able to get back to full activity? That's what he was asking. And the answer is if you were very careful, you could. Yes. Yes, back to that. Is it a random event then? You said That's a good question. Is it a random event? The answer is folding itself is not a random event. We don't fully understand <laughs> it. I'm going to give you some statistics on that. In a little bit, if not in the lecture next time. I, I'll try to get to that today. I have a question back here also. I was just going to ask if folding is built into all proteins. Yeah, yeah, good question. How come only this is the only protein that does that? This is not the only protein that does it, but it's a rare protein. Okay? If folding is built into all proteins, how come all proteins don't do that? Because we can imagine once we take them apart, they all can make disulfide bonds. Maybe they make disulfide bonds the wrong way. And this one has the unique ability not to make those and come back and fold itself. It's a complicated answer to your question. I mean, there's a, your, your question is very complicated, so I don't have a simple answer to that, but that's one way. What we discover is that when we take proteins apart and we misfold them, we can drive the folding in the wrong direction. That's also something that happens. And when we do that, then there's no way of getting back over that, that hump. But, but I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in just a bit. Yes, sir? Nothing stopping it. That's why the mercaptoethanol is important in helping to improve that folding later. Okay. Okay. Good questions. You're thinking about this. Happy to happy to see that. Okay. Um, I talked about reduction. Here's the actual reduction that happens. It's kind of hard to envision. Some people say they like to see those on the screen. So when I talk about reducing disulfide bonds, this is what's going on right here. Okay. This is mercaptoethanol. That's what it looks like. You don't need to draw that structure. But I'm showing you that you're going from this structure over to this structure. We've broken that support beam and made this over here. So when I add mercaptoethanol, there's another reagent that we can add that does the same thing. It's called dithiothreatol, or you can call it DTT. Not DDT, but DTT. Okay? DTT will do the same thing. Okay. I've mentioned things that can disrupt structure, and now uh, you've seen uh, two of them, mercaptoethanol, there's urea. Urea is the, the stuff in your pee that stinks, okay? And guanidinium chloride is another reagent that can disrupt hydrogen bonds. So this guy will disrupt hydrogen bonds, this guy will disrupt hydrogen bonds, this guy will disrupt disulfide bonds. What did I say would disrupt hydrophobic bonds? Detergent, right? Okay. Detergent will disrupt hydrophobic bonds. All these are important reagents. Okay, um, let's see, how am I doing on time? Since I had a question on folding, let me just say a, a couple things about folding. So first of all, um, folding is, uh, his question was, is if folding is built into all proteins, how come I can't refold this protein properly? And as I said, it's a complicated question, can't completely answer, but we can imagine there's some misfoldings and so forth that happen. Some proteins have a better ability to fold than other proteins do. Because of that, our cells have special structures in them that help proteins to fold properly. And as we will see, folding of proteins properly is important. Okay? Let's imagine that I have a protein that I'm making over here. And this protein, for whatever reason, is full of hydrophobic amino acids, a lot of hydrophobic amino acids. Okay? Now, the mature protein is going to fold. It's going to put those hydrophobic amino acids on the inside. But in the process of being made, there's all this long string of hydrophobic amino acids that's floating out here in the cell as it's being made, one amino acid at a time. Could that pose a problem? The answer is it could. Because if I have an identical protein being made right next to it, we can imagine that the hydrophobic amino acids of that protein might interact with this one and prevent it from folding properly. Because the hydrophobics like each other, and they'll start associating with each other before the folding can really get going properly. We could make a great big agglomeration of proteins, that, of, of individual proteins that would be of no use. 
So cells have a structure called chaperones. Molecular chaperones, they're a class of proteins called chaperonins, and you can call them either as far as I'm concerned, concern, that take proteins and as allow them to fold without interacting with other proteins. How does this work? Okay. Well, a chaperone basically is a barrel-like chamber. And that barrel-like chamber, when you have a protein that needs to be folded properly, its synthesis goes into that chamber. It doesn't get a chance to interact with hydrophobics of other proteins. The inside of this chamber doesn't allow it to interact with the chamber. This protein is left to its own devices. This protein is left to fold on its own. So the chaperone allows this protein to go through its own folding and not interacting with other things. That's a very important compo uh, 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 consideration for some proteins. That makes sense what that's doing now? Chaperones? Well, what happens if we allow misfolding to happen? If we allow misfolding to happen, in some cases we have disaster. We've heard of mad cow disease. There's a related human disease called Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome. And it's caused by the very same problem that causes mad cow disease. Mad cow disease is caused not by a virus, but by something we call an infectious protein. It's called a prion, P-R-I-O-N. And people were very puzzled when they first started studying prions because no matter how hard they looked, they could take an infected animal. There's a, there, it's, it's found in mad cows. It's also found in disease in sheep called scrapie. They're both neurological diseases where the brain basically ceases to function. The same thing happens in humans that get Creutzfeldt-Jakob. They could take these infected samples and they could transmit it from one organism to another. But when they analyzed what was there, they couldn't find any nucleic acid. There's no RNA. There's no DNA, no matter how hard they looked. And finally, a man named Stanley Prusner says, well, the problem is that we don't have um, any RNA or DNA. What we have is an infectious protein. And people said, how can you have an infectious protein? What are you, some kind of an idiot? What is that protein and what happened, OK, what it, they discovered was that this protein was a misfolded protein. Now, a misfolded protein isn't infectious by, by itself, we wouldn't think. But it turns out that this misfolded protein has a very bizarre property. It induces other identical proteins to fold in the same way. The protein that causes mad cow disease, the protein that causes Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome, is in every one of your brains. If you get a single misfolded protein in those cells, it can induce those proteins to start misfolding, which in turn cause others to start to misfold, which cause others to start to misfold. That's a scary phenomenon. That's how a, an infectious protein propagates itself. It's a normal, it's not a mutant protein, it's a normal protein found in your head. Yes, sir? So are prions ever recognized by the immune system? Are prions ever recognized by the immune system? I would never say never, but as far as I know, uh, no. There's, there's some effort right now to make antibodies against it to see if they can treat it, and there's been some limited success with that. But naturally, no. So the reason people get, you know, like mad cow disease is because they're eating, like, infected meat? So will eating infected meat give you mad cow disease? That's debated, okay? There was an, uh, an increase in mad cow disease in England in the late 1980s. Uh, and it followed thereafter an unusual form of human Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome that arose from that. And the thinking was that maybe that was related. That is argued. I will tell you the thing that scares you, though. We talk about stable proteins. The prion protein is stabler than ribonuclease. If you want to denature the prion protein by cooking your meat, you've got to take it up to 700 degrees. And I haven't seen any recipes that say, you know, based at 700 degrees for three hours. It's not considered a good move, OK? Now, whether you can be transmitted through your food, as I said, that's argued. I won't say that it, it can or it cannot, OK? I'll make some big enemies if I do that. But that's an important consideration. So prions are really scary things. They induce other proteins to do what they've already got. Here's a normal. It's called PRP. Here's the normal protein. 
Here is a bad one. And what do you suppose is happening? Well, we've got some hydrophobics that start associating with each other. And because they associate, it doesn't fold properly. It, is, it folds improperly, and it makes this aberrant structure. These are what we call amyloid plaques. And when we analyze the brains of animals or people who have these, they have these big, humongous, ugly structures that are just polymers of this protein that look like this. OK, that's a bad piece of news. I thought we would finish on a good piece of news. We finish on a song. You guys up for a song? OK. Let's do. Please join me. Oh, little protein molecule. Join me. You're lovely and serene with 20 zwitter ions like cysteine and alanine. Your secondary structure has pitches and repeats arranged in alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. The Ramachandran plots are predictions made to try, can't hear you, to tell the structures you can have for angles phi and psi. And tertiary structure gives polypeptide zing because of magic that occurs in protein folding. A folded enzyme's active and starts to catalyze when activators bind into its allosteric sites. Some other mechanisms control the enzyme rates by regulating synthesis and placement of phosphates. And all the regulation that's found inside of cells reminds the students learning in a pathway straight from hell. So here's how to remember the phosphate strategies. We'll talk about this. They turn the GPBs to A's and GSAs to B's. All right, guys. See you Friday. Yes, sir. So when you were talking about the mercurto what is it? mercurto -ethanol. OK. So you were putting that in, and it was breaking up the sulfide bonds, OK? Mm -hmm. And you guys were talking about they were rearranging and possibly misfolding or mm -hmm. grabbing on a different one. Are you taking it out of that for it to rearrange? Yes. Or to come back? Yes. OK. You need to take it out. So it's not like that. Yeah. No, it doesn't stay there. It's okay. fairly easy to get it out. Oh, OK. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. Do they know what causes the folding of the prion?